At all times, tracks, trailways and highways served humanity as keys to evolution. Empires and civilizations have disappeared. Centuries-old dust swept capitals and cities, but roads kept bringing new people here. Do we understand how roads revitalized the place hundreds of years ago and how do they change people's destinies today? We go on the expedition, the treasures of the nation to find and reveal facts about life at crossroads of antiquity. Motorways are just the top of centuries, but if the trail is left, it will surely be found even thousands of years later. In this episode, how to look underground without shoveling. What trade route could have competed with the Great Silk Road? What laid the first walking routes in the Irtish area? Everybody knows about the Great Silk Road. It used to connect east and west and seemed to be sowing life, hacking its way through. Over time, caravan sarais and noisy bazaars appeared on it. Artisans, merchants and tradesmen were setting on its roadsides. And everything you know was sort of fading in its fame. But we learned about the existence of another trade highway, which passed through the territory of ancient Kazakhstan, connecting south and north. Did you know about this? We are setting out in search of it. All aboard the expedition the treasures of the nation. Let's go! The expedition The Treasures of the Nation sets out to Pavlodar. The route is mapped along the Highway of National Significance, which is included to this center east corridor. The distance from Astana is almost 450 kilometers. We are in Pavlodar. This city is almost 300 years old. Historians argue that it was built in 1720 and there are numerous facts that there was a brisk trade here in those distant times. Where did the goods come from, what goods and where they were taken to? Having found that out, we'll get on the track of this cherished road. A remarkable arch. I so want to stand here like this to fill those times. Touch it. How wonderful, after all, that all this is preserved. Later our group will have a worthful meeting with a man who knows about the history of the city and the region more than most. While there is still time, it was decided to visit the Museum of Local Law. What a fabulous thing! A well-made reconstruction, probably. Is it right, miss? I'm sorry, what did you say? Is it a reconstruction? No, you're wrong. It is not a reconstruction, but an original skeleton of the Irish elk. It is a very unique object. I doubt it's original. Because there are only three of them in the whole world. One in Kiev, one in Moscow, and this one in Pavlodar. It is a very unique find of more than one and a half million years old. The uniqueness of this exhibit is that it was found precisely in the form in which you see it now. The animal was bogged down into the cold mire which swallowed and plunged it into eternal sleep. But the roommate, a mammoth, is a pure puzzle. It was framed from various parts discovered during the excavations throughout Irtish land. 
Can you tell is the hall of modern time here? The hall of modern time is further, almost at the end of the corridor. Museum showcases of the modern time exposition tell in living color how the city of Pavlodar appeared. It dates back to 1720 when a Karakovsky outpost on the Irtysh appeared among a number of Russian military fortresses and outposts named so because it was built next to the storehouses of salt mined on Karakovsky Lake. The city eventually overgrew with merchant mansions and storages. Trading rows have been organizing which apparently were full of anything that would be money. By the way, the place of the former trade rows in Palada has been preserved. There it is, plan to meet with the well-known local historian Ernest Sokolkin. Ernest, we've heard that there was an ancient trade route which connected north and south on the way to Omsk. All trade routes till Pavlada were going down the Irtysh. Of course, the trade route was accompanied by the export of furs from the north and woods. Our famous Yamyshevska Karakovska salt was also coming from here. So this is our fur route, salt route. Furs were the trade object, it was exchanged by goods. Let's say one arctic fox was equivalent to one basket of salt and one Siberian marten to two baskets of salt and so on. So it turns out that if the Great Silk Road connected west and east, then the fur route connected north and south. North and south, right? And Pavada was right at the crossroads of two routes. Yes, the two cities of Pavada and Semipalatin Road, and then the third city of Omsk joined them. Local historian of Pavlodar Ernest Sokolkin told us that in the 17th century the road connecting south and north was called the Fur Route. It is very interesting whether it operated in the Middle Ages. To find that out, we found Pavlodar archaeologist Timur Smagulov via the internet and we are going to meet him right now. Now in this building, the study of an ancient medieval civilizations is going on about which there is much debate in the scientific community. For many years, the research has been led by archaeologist Timur Smagulov. Timur, we are now studying the north-south trade route. So far, we've learned that during the Russian development of Irtysh land, it was called a fur route and was quite impressive in terms of trade. So I wonder how much it roots go deep into antiquity. Did it exist in the Middle Ages, for example? There is an archaeological monument, Bobrovsky burial mound, in which both the funeral rite and clothing inventory show the interaction. What do we see there? We see vessels and burials that were made in the classical Podshevash tradition. Podchevash culture is the culture of Western Siberia during the early Middle Ages. Figurative stamp and the shape of vessels are distinctive of this culture. And at the same time, in the burials themselves, we see weapons typical of the nomads of the Kimak Khanate. According to the data of Orientalists who studied written sources, the northern limits of the country of the Kimaks ended somewhere in Siberia. Because it is known that the snow level was higher than the spear and camels could no longer live in such cold conditions. Apparently caravans coming from the markets of the Middle East and China were reaching those places. Timur Smagulov showed us how archaeological excavation should be carried out in the 21st century on an example of burials of two Kimak warriors. 
Several years ago, we decided to use the methods of computed tomography, and now, thanks to CAT, we managed to scan this block of soil and see its contents before clearing it. Here is how it looks on CAT. Here on the monitor you can see the relics of the Kimak warrior. These are jewelries or what? Yes, it is a burial of 10th, 12th centuries. And here on the belt we clearly see the artifacts. Really a very clear picture. Let's take a brush. A big one? Yes, this will be enough. Now let's look together. What do we see? Almost a thousand years has passed and you can see the remains of leather thing in front of you. Apparently it was clothing which used to be at the belt. Here we also see a wooden fragment. And here we are now cleaning up phalanges, do you see? Right here. Are those finger phalanges? Yes, here a human hand used to be. So thanks to this method you found all your trophies. Maybe there was something else interesting. Well, even if we take this find, it has a very interesting history of origin. We've had excavations here in Pavlodar suburb. We saw that the ancient mound covers an even more ancient road. And this cart, this wheeled house located right next to the ancient road that ran along the right banks of the Irtysh river was right where once the trade routes described in medieval sources in the sources of modern times were laid. Well, this finding is very symbolic. Very symbolic. But still, in order to prove the existence of this route, there must be similar artifacts at the other end of it. Today, this is the Omsk region. Do Russian Omsk archaeologists have similar findings to Kimak's ones? If you follow the ancient road to the north, then of course this will inevitably lead you to Omsk, where there is a huge amount of material about the northern borders of the Kimak's country. Well, let us not believe you and check ourselves. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Our group of researchers goes to Omsk. On the way, it was decided to visit archaeological excavations. Here, a hundred meters below the asphalt, one of the chains of Kimak's barrows is being uncovered. Is this a Kimak barrow? Yes, supposedly it is a Kimak barrow. Before making a mound, they were building a structure, but they made a grave first. The building was built of raw bricks, so they dug up ditches and made this mound. As you can see, bricks are of a dark color. They are not taken from simple soil, but from the Irtysh floodplain. Because of this, they sort of mixed with silt and have a dark color. Well, thank you very much. I wish you find the prince and the princess, the king and the queen. Okay, thank you. May you have new discoveries. Goodbye. Goodbye. Traveling in time along the fur route, moving along the ancient roads of the Kimaks country, how great the surprise of our team was when they found out that these directions have been in existence for thousands of years. Well, here it is, Lake could I call. It is from here the ancient people in the Stone Age, thousands of years ago, delivered stones as far as Siberia and even further. As we were told, not only quartzite was delivered along this path, but also flint, jasper and crystal. Perhaps, therefore, we can call this path not only a fir route, but also a stone route. Is it really so? In what volumes were stones delivered? And what was done with it at that end? We'll find out in Omsk. Let's go! Ah, I see the border with Russia in distance which means that we're approaching the northern point of the fur route. Here we hope to see with our own eyes the artifacts that prove its existence and look forward to meeting with Russian scientists.
Omsk is the administrative center of the Omsk region. It is situated at the confluence of the Irtysh and Om rivers. The territory of Omsk has been of great importance since ancient times. Here there are settlements and burial mounds of many peoples who lived here from the 6th millennium BC. From time immemorial, this land was inhabited by different peoples and our compatriots are no exception. <laughs> The head of the Kazakh National Moldia Center, Altinai Zhunusova, was born in Omsk. Meeting with her is an outlet of our group. There is an opportunity to rest after a long trip. Over the cup of tea in a warm fraternal atmosphere, the expedition members decided to find out how important in the ancient Ferrous Stone Route among the modern Omsk population, whether this highway is a thread connecting Omsk Kazakhs with their historical homeland. So our Kazakh Omsk youth, do you visit Kazakhstan? Yes, we do. Of course we do. Rosa, in which city have you been? In Astana, in Petropavlovsk, in Kokshetau, in Kizil too. Oh, you've been to many cities. How did you move? By car? By bus? Having enjoyed a real Kazakh cuisine, songs with Dombra and a warm conversation, the expedition members were going to say goodbye to hospitable hosts. However, another small surprise was waiting for them. Well. Koprahmet. Everything was tasty, warm and cozy, but unfortunately we have to go. Rahmet to you, Arman. We are pleased that you've visited our home and our city. I want you to have a gift in commemoration of this visit. Thank you. Look what a fancy thing it is. From Omsk. Let's ride on our ancestors' roads. Koprahmet. Saubol and Izdar. So we've agreed upon a meeting with an interesting specialist, Alexei Matveyev, who has been studying the fur route for a long time. And now we're here at the place of former fortress. Here he will tell us about the period of Russian reclamation of Irtysh land. Hello, Alexei. Hello, Oman. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Well, let's have a talk. With pleasure. Let's walk here and you will show and tell us everything. So, is this the first fortress that was built here? No, we are currently on the territory of the second Olmsk fortress built in 1768, whereas the first one appeared in 1716, that is, 50 years earlier. It was built not here but a little bit southwards on the opposite bank of the Olm River. Does it mean that every redoubt or fortress would have garrisons and would communicate with each other somehow, would receive representatives of the Kazakh population? I understand that they were trying to build good relations with the locals. Of of course, it paid off to travel along this route. The journey along the Irtysh usually went by water. The river is flowing northwards and thus it was very convenient to use it for transporting different goods, including cattle. They were also transporting a lot of timber, as with time the Omsk fortress needed more and more of it. They basically cut down almost all the forest in the area. When the route was active, that was a time when other routes could not be used due to, say, Timur's conquest. It was used as a supplementary route. The main the main route still went from the city of Turkestan to the city of Ishim, then from Ishim to the city of Tobolsk. That was the main trade route. In case there was some kind of problem along that road, some military action, for example, the Irtysh road would be used instead of the main road. It existed for several centuries, and when the main way could not be used for some reason, the communities along it would develop and flourish. That is, education, metallurgy, stone processing would emerge and progress. When the need to exchange or trade goods would come, life here would thrive and the local population would become richer and better off. Yes, it was operating for centuries and sometimes was the only way to transport goods. When the main way could not be used for some reason, the communities along it would develop and flourish. I mean, education, metallurgy, stone processing would emerge and progress. When the need to exchange or trade goods would come, life here would thrive and the local population would become richer and better off. We heard that even the Kima Kaganate was prospering thanks to 
to this route to a large extent. At that time, it was a mass appearance of Turkic population here during the Kima Khanate. These territories were probably not under its control, but were subject to it. They paid tribute. But Sergei Tataurov can tell you more about it. I recommend you talk to him. Thank you very much. That's something at least. It was very interesting. I wish you luck in your work, Alexei. Thank you very much. We are in the laboratory of the Omsk scientist, candidate of historical sciences, Sergei Tataurov, who can tell us about the Kimaks. Interestingly, now we're exploring this route called the Fur Route. But did it exist in the period of Kimak Khanate? According to the data of archaeologists. Yes, we fixed the material culture and objects. The funeral rite, which was alien to these northern territories, but no further. And now the question arose of really studying the Kima Kipchak world on our territory. The question arose of revising everything we have accumulated so far, of everything we have at the moment, and a very interesting situation turns out. It turned out that cultures outlined here, Pochevash and Ustishim cultures, which existed permissible from the 7th to 13th centuries AD, they are not of local origin, but of the southern one. It turned out that in those days a fairly large migration wave of Kimaks came from the south and a significant part of the arriving population settled in these places. The other part of the population went further to the north, then returned after a while and also settled here for the second time. And what have they reached in the north? According to objects which we have found, they moved far enough. Meaning firstly the huge amount of ust Paleuski bronze casting, big amount of noisy slings made of bronze, it is the northern Ural, it is Perm and so on. Settled in the northern Irtysh land, Kimaks left not only funerary but also settlement constructions. But they broke a path, built ancient cities. Was there a trade? Did they use this route to bring something here and to take anything from here? First of all, it was metal. A large number of metal products which were made in the south, starting with the belt sets and jewelries, and up to certain utensils and so on. Can you prove that these are the Kimak stuff? Can you show something? This is one of the warriors' burials we've excavated the last year. And there was a set of arrows with bone whistles. You can take it, which is distinctive rather for southern territories, for the actual Kimaks territory, not for us. So these are the Kimaks arrows, aren't they? Yes, and we can hold those arrows which have been made more to the south. Well, thank you so much for such a circumstantial talk. Good luck. Thank you. And thank you, Arman, for touching this topic and for coming here. And this is what I was talking about. Another step for our close friendship. Come here frequently. Well, we have to answer the last question whether there was a fur route in the Stone Age. An employee of Omsk State University, archaeologist Irina Tolpeko, will help us to figure it out. Irina, here in Omsk we found practically all evidences of existence of the fur route, which connected north and south during the Russian reclamation of Irtysh land, and in times of Kimak Khanate. But we've been told in Pavlodar that it existed even in the Stone Age. Is it true? 
Well, I can say that it is true, but it probably can be called the Stone Route because the main resource which could connect modern Kazakhstan and modern territory of Omsk region was certainly the stone. Irtysh could become one of such ways, but certainly it brings us to Kazakhstan because it turned out that the nearest outcrops of stone raw materials and very good ones, at least good enough for making tools and weapons, they situated literally near the territory of Kazakhstan, in somewhere four to five hundred kilometers from here. How do you think they have discovered those outcrops? Did they go scouting from here and searched everywhere around? Before the Mesolithic age we can assume that they came to our territory from your territory, from the territory of Kazakhstan. Do you mean they initially came here? Yes, they went here perhaps for herds of animals and most likely even for herds of migrating animals. And they came from places where they knew the stone was. They knew what stone it was and when they came here to our territory, they subsequently knew that there was no stone and they should carry it with them. So if talking about the existence of the stone route, how many thousands of years do you give it? With good reason we can say that yes, about 10,000 years ago this route began to function and it definitely functioned. The expedition is close to completion. All the goals have been achieved. There is only a small final touch. Here we are at the doorstep of Omsk Museum of Local Law, where we've been sent to by archaeologist Sergei Tataurov to see artifacts of the Kimax period with our own eyes. Now here it is, Kimak warrior, about whom archaeologist Sergei Tataurov told us earlier. The warrior who has been found here in the Omsk region and who has passed away but continues to serve the science. Hello. Please tell us, how could those beautiful animals appear at both places? Here and in Pavlodar. Here at the exposition there are the remains of various ancient animals and almost all of them made long-term migrations in their historical development. Here, for example, is the Irish elk. The Irish elk, here it is. We've seen it in Pavlodar, so it existed here also. Yes, of course, we do not have much here as in the Pavlodar region. Even its horns are broken off, but the first known reliable ancestors of the Irish elk are known from Tuva. And from there animals already settled in Eurasia, reaching England to the west, Ireland. There are lots of them there. And how old are these bones? Well, on the territory of Omsk region, most of findings of large fossil mammals have an age of 400,000 years till present days. I mean, our macro region long time ago was the center of animals' roads crossing. And then people's roads in the same way. Well, thank you very much for an informative talk. We've literally made a discovery. Good luck. Goodbye. The search for ancient ways in which peoples traveled in our lands unexpectedly led us to the roads laid by our most distant ancestors, primitive animals. What is 500 years for a fur route? What is 1,000 years of Kima caravan trails? What is 20,000 years of the stone route of the Neolithic age. All this just fades in comparison with tens of millions of years of animal paths along which long extinct primitive animals wandered. Now I understand this ancient wisdom of nomads. Love animals and learn from them. Still animals are the first inhabitants of this planet and we really have something to learn from them.
to discover new roads and to travel the old ones.